So Echinid Oman wants to know uh, why does space allow the accumulation of matter up to the point of a black hole, but it's hard for space to be devoid of matter. Uh, so, you know, with a black hole, you've got that singularity, which is sort of a point of infinite density. Around that is the event horizon. This is the region where you have to be going faster than the speed of light to escape the black hole. But you've still got things that are inside that event horizon. You've got gravity, for example. You know, the gravity from a black hole that's far away is still making its way into that event horizon and even affecting that singularity. So you've still got things. You've got st stuff that's still affecting within that region. So there's still no place in the universe that is a perfect vacuum, whether you're inside the event horizon of a black hole or anywhere else. There's atoms of hydrogen, there's vacuum energy, there's all kinds of things out there across the universe. You just can't have a place that is a complete and total vacuum. Uh, Jacqueline Johnson wants to know, what are the chances there are unknown sources of energy in the Earth or the air that we could use as a more efficient fuel system for space travel or even daily life? Uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, what our physics and our science is going to figure out in the future, but we do know some of the sort of physical limits of what this universe can do. And so we know that the most energy you could generate from mass is, according to Einstein, E equals mc squared. So there is a theoretical upper limit, and that's when you make antimatter and regular matter and you put them together, you get perfect energy out of that. So that is the theoretical upper limit for how much energy we could extract if we come up with better. Now right now it's incredibly expensive to do that, but maybe in the future we're going to figure out a better way to, to harness that. <clears throat> there's fusion, there's fission, you know, beyond that we don't know of more efficient fuel systems. So who knows what the future is going to hold? Uh, Larry Parent wants to know, what are the real chances that intelligent life exists on other planets and how far away would the near civilization be? So right now we only have our own solar system as an example of where there is life in the universe. We don't know if there's life anywhere else in around any other star. And in fact, you know, the Fermi paradox is this idea that, you know, if the, the universe is big and it's old and there's lots of places to live, so where are all the aliens? This is a really troubling problem. And so right now, we have no way to know whether we're the only intelligent life in the entire universe or whether there's lots of life forms all around us. It's going to take better telescopes, better observations over the next few years for us to get to the bottom of this question. So Dante Alfred Connors wants to know what exists beyond the universe. So we don't know what is outside the universe. You know, the universe is this, uh, you know, it could be infinite, which means the universe could go on forever in all directions. And so the question doesn't really make sense because what's outside infinity? You, you can't go there. So if the universe is finite, it still might be a nonsense question because it's not like the universe is embedded within some bigger thing. If it was in, embedded in some bigger thing, that would also be the universe. Uh, but but you know the best way to think of this is like think of a game of asteroids where you go you know upwards in the game of asteroid and then you appear at the bottom and you go to the right in the game and you appear at the, uh, on the other side. So. If you kept going in any direction, you would return to your starting point. And that, if it's a finite universe, that's kind of what you, what astronomers think there is. And so, like once again, you know, what is outside your your game of asteroids? You can't get there because anywhere you try to go, you just return back to your starting point. And so, again, the question is sort of, you can't ask that question. Eddie MJ wants to know: Are we alone in the universe? So we don't know if we're alone in the universe, right? There might be aliens uh, on other stars all around us. There might be, we might be the only civilization in the entire universe. I personally find the Fermi paradox, this idea that, you know, the universe is super old, very, you know, has been around for a long time, lots of places to live, where are all the aliens? It's a really troubling problem because we should see some evidence of aliens somewhere out there. Uh, and yet we don't. And so for me, uh, the idea that we are alone in the universe is one of the more likely ones. Uh, 
So then the, you know, but, but we're going to know better and better. There's new telescopes coming that's going to allow us to, to detect the atmospheres of other uh, star systems, of planets around other stars. So we'll know eventually uh, if, you know, as we search further and further out to know how far are we alone until either we find some evidence of other life or we just keep never finding evidence of life. So John Drago wants to know, explain the concept that the universe does not have a center. So, you know, we always say this, right? The, everywhere is the center of the universe. And so sort of there's a bunch of different ways to think about this, right? One is, is that the universe is infinite in size. And so if the universe is infinite, you can go in an infinite direction in one direction, infinite direction in the other, then you're at the center. Although there's really, you know, it doesn't really make sense, but you are essentially at the center. In the, from the observable universe, you can see you know, 13.8 billion light years in all directions. And so my version of the universe, I can see 13.8 billion years, but I'm able to see a different sphere than you because the light has to take a little longer to get from me to you and you to me. So again, I'm at the center and you're at the center of your own personal uh, observable universe. And the last idea is that the universe is finite. And so the idea that astronomers have is that the universe actually wraps on itself. So if you move in any direction, you're going to move back to the beginning the same rate. So this means that once again, you're at the center of the universe. So in fact, you know, you can look at it two ways. One, everything is the center of the universe, but also there is no center to the universe. Take your pick. So Eddie MJ wants to know, how come the universe is made of matter and not antimatter? So Eddie, this is one of the big questions that astronomers are still working with, right? Which is that at the very beginning, there, it's believed there were roughly equivalent amounts of matter and antimatter that came together and, you know, and self-annihilated with each other. But in fact, there was like a little more matter than there was antimatter. And so we now have a universe that is matter and not antimatter or not equal amounts of matter and antimatter smashing into each other. And right now the answer is that astronomers just don't know. It's one of those mysteries. We're really lucky that it happened this way, but you know, this mystery remains open. So Bill George wants to know, now that we've found gravity waves, what can that do for us or for our future? Uh, so one of the great things about gravity waves, it allows us to see into regions that have previously been completely hidden. So you can imagine, right, you've got the, you've got a black hole, you've got this event horizon around the black hole and the singularity at the middle. There's, there's no way to see any electromagnetic rays coming out from the singularity. And so that part within the event horizon is completely opaque. But the great thing about gravitational waves is that they do go in there. And so you could imagine, right, you have two black holes coming together, they spin up, they collide, and, but they're within the event horizon, but you can still detect the waves coming out as they collide. Another place is like at the very edge of the observable universe, beyond the cosmic microwave background radiation, it's still about 300,000 years till the actual Big Bang. Their light can't get out of there, but gravity could. So it could be possible that we could see eventually beyond the cosmic microwave right to the edge of the Big Bang. So really, it's a whole new set of eyeballs that astronomers have never had before. It's really exciting. Uh, Mijo Grabovac wants to know, black holes are massive, but what is the maximum mass one of them could obtain if they grow too big? Will they cut through the fabric of space-time and let's create a new Big Bang? So there is no upper limit to how massive black holes can get. They could, you could take all of the mass in the entire universe and you could put it into one big black hole and all you would get is a black hole. It would still be embedded within space-time and it wouldn't create a new Big Bang. Now, uh, it would actually have an event horizon as big as the observable universe, which is pretty interesting, but you still wouldn't get anything special happening that wasn't just a regular uh, black hole. So John Battle Sr. wants to know, when the sun turns into a red giant, what will happen to the outer gas planets? Will they spin off into space or sucked into the sun or just keep on spinning? So when the, uh, when, the, when the sun does turn into a red giant in about, say, 7 billion years from now, it's going to eat Mercury, it's going to eat Venus. It might eat Earth, it might not eat Earth, don't know yet. 
Um, <clears throat> Mars will get baked to a crisp. For the outer planets, it all depends on how much mass the sun gives off. The sun, as it goes through this red giant phase, is going to spray out mass. And this change in mass will change the orbits of those outer planets. They may collide with each other, uh, or they may just move into different orbits that are more balanced to when the sun sort of finally shrinks back down and becomes a white dwarf. So, uh, you know, the, the calculations are still not entirely certain what's going to happen.